Thanks so much for everyone to come along today. We've got a few webinars coming up and today we wanted to talk to you about country by country reporting and what is it and why should you care and, and what's really the focus point on that. So I'm going to start, um, I'll just give you a bit of an introduction for those of you and I think half of you um, we've worked with before, half of you are, are new to transfer pricing solutions to so just give you a little bit of a background about who we are and I'll go through um, all of our, the presenters shortly. Transfer pricing solutions, we're very focused on obviously transfer pricing and one of our key focus points is really on providing practical, proactive and cost effective transfer pricing advice. Uh, we've, I founded transfer pricing back in um, 2007, so next year will be our 15th birthday. And those of, the, of you that have worked with us before really know we try and come up with a really practical solution. Um, we're not just focused on, you know, in, uh, I guess, creating documentation. So you've got more documentation on your shel shelf, but really trying to come up with what is a practical solution and cost benefit looking at that as well, because there's many companies that are now faced with transfer pricing challenges that um, hadn't in the past. And country by country reporting is now just another one of those as well. Um, from a structure perspective, um, we now actually have our own transfer pricing issues that we need to consider as a firm. Uh, so transfer pricing solutions in Australia, I set that up obviously a number of years ago. Um, we set up with my business partner, Adriana. Adriana worked with me for um, about six years in Australia before we, um, she then ventured off to Singapore and we set up our Singapore office over there about five years ago. And we set up our Malaysian office approximately two years ago and up until COVID, HC was spending six weeks in um, Australia and six weeks in Malaysia. He's actually based in Australia, but he was spending quite a bit of time catching up with family back there as well and, and uh, with that. But given uh, everything that's gone on, our team in Malaysia now have been with that HC uh, in face-to-face -face for quite some time. So hopefully we can get over that and um, get back to Singapore and Malaysia soon. Yep. Um, we are well recognised in the industry for our expertise on transfer pricing. We have won a number of um, awards, not only in Australia, but also in Asia, our Malaysian office, our Singapore office and Australia um, at the Asia Tax Awards. And, and also we were um, announced a tier two transfer pricing advisor in Australia and Singapore, which was very um, exciting. That got announced last year as well. So you are in good, safe hands. Um, now, who is it that you're going to be dealing with? So my name is Shannon Smith. For those that haven't met me before, um, I've been specialising in transfer pricing for over 25 years now. Um, I, I am also on the board of tax advisory panel, um, assisting um, the Australian government on, on looking at the tax laws. We also have um, Kevin and HC. Now, both of those have been with transfer pricing solutions for a number of years and prior to that also in the big accounting firms both in Malaysia in Australia um, and here as well and um, have basically close to I think 10 years both of you um, each have experience and a senior manager so we have a really strong team here not only in Australia and then also our team in Singapore and Malaysia as well but let's get stuck into country by country reporting and what's triggered us to kind of really do this um, go through this session with you we get a lot of questions I want to go through through who does it who does it apply to um, what is country by country reporting when do I need to lodge and how do I need to lodge and country by country reporting was really part of a wide range of international measures that were aimed at combating tax avoidance um, through a comprehensive exchange of information between countries so country by country reporting and transfer pricing documentation was really introduced what some of you might have heard the acronym BEPS, um, Base Erosion and Profit Shifting. And this has really come out from the OECD side and we've kind of in a sense that's just been flowing around but it is a way in which the tax authorities around the world are wanting to, in, to share information. So the Aust Australia has adopted their version of um, the country by country reporting and that's what I really wanna go through um, today with you as well. So who does it apply to? So really when I get to that, you know, why should you care? When should you care? Um, whether you be a, a finance or tax manager at a company or an, you're an accountant and you have some clients that have the foreign um, transactions going on, when, um, when does this apply to you? Now, it is really, really, really important because you don't want to avoid um, preparing and not preparing it and find out later that you have an issue because you receive a penalty notice coming through. And it is quite challenging, especially for those that may be working in or working with foreign subsidiaries because 
because we're not always getting um, all of the information. So there is going to be a bit of groundwork that's going to need to be performed on your side to make sure you cover it also just from a liability perspective that you have gone through and made, um, made the appropriate inquiries. The other big issue too is that in Australia, when you're signing off on your tax return and you're the public officer, you are actually signing off that your transfer pricing is correct as part of your um, tax return. And that includes um, the information that's related to um, the country by country reporting as well. So that's a risk from a public officer. And then also obviously from an accountant, we do receive many calls from accountants when they're getting such penalty letters that I'll show you later. Um, in resolving that. Now, so when does that actually apply to you? So there have been some changes. So if you have your company or a client that you actually thought, look, significant global entity doesn't apply to us, um, you may need to think again. So there were some changes that came out in the 2018, 2019 federal budget, they actually, uh, the government announced their intention, and this is actually in Australia, on an Australian side, but they announced their intention to expand the definition um, expand the definition of a significant global entity. So what, what we had in before, we had the country by country reporting um, is the parent is, has a global income of more than one, 1 billion Australian dollars. But what we're really looking at is now in the past, we focused on from an, that they had consolidated for accounting purposes so that if that entity was consolidated for accounting purposes, they were grouped up in that. Well, this has been actually expanded. There were many that fell outside of that. And so now we actually actually have it to be actually that includes entities headed by an entity other than not necessarily just a listed company or having to be um, consolidated. So it is something that you do need to look at the expanded definition. So if you've done this pre 1st of July 19 for your client, please go back, check it um, and make sure because the expanded definition of a significant global entity and SGEs, we like to call it, will actually apply to the income years um, commencing on and after 1st of July 2019. And it's not only for the country by country reporting, it's also going to be applicable for what we call the MUL, the multinational, um, multinational anti-avoidance law. We will be doing a webinar on that in a number of weeks um, and also the diverted profit tax as well. And it does actually bring you into the increased penalties um, on that side as well. So it is worth going back and making sure um, whether you actually are considered to be an SGE or not, or whether your parent is considered to be an SGE and now you're linked in under that, which is really important for um, the foreign, foreign uh, subsidiaries that you've got here. So what is country by country reporting? Now, country by country reporting statements, we have actually a few components of, um, of the country by country reporting. So it incorporates the revised standards of transfer pricing documentation. And then I guess some common templates that all the SGEs, so the significant global entities need to complete to report income and other measures of economic activity for each of the countries in which they conduct the activities. So it basically wants, um, what they're trying to do is by preparing, and so once you've, you're required to complete the country by country reporting, it's feeding data into all the various tax authorities and there's this sharing mechanism. And it's basically trying to compare and have a look at the economic activities versus the financial outcomes versus the tax payable. Now, many of you might've heard in recent years um, the amount of tax that Google has paid. Um, I think it was actually only two weeks ago in the Fin Review or a week ago about Facebook and the um, tax rate. Where did that information come from? A lot of that information is starting to come from through, um, through going through these areas. So the country by country reporting, when we talk about that, there is actually a country by country report. That is one piece of the puzzle. There is a master file and then there is a local file. Now, the thing that you need to make note, now I've put it here. So kind of when we send the notes out, highlight it. Your local file is not transfer pricing documentation. And Kevin's going to go through this in a bit more detail as we go through this presentation. And the local file consists of the short form, part A and part B. So we're going to go through each of these different pieces with you um, as well. So some people get confused when they hear CBC report, they think of just that report. 
In addition to that, when we talk about CBC reporting, we're talking about the master file, the local file and the CBC report as well. So we've got this CBC report here for you. Um, and what the CBC report is generally, it's generally prepared by the ultimate parent entity. So if you're an Australian multinational, you're most likely going to be the one that is preparing it and, um, and lodging this report. If it's a foreign subsidiary here in Australia, this report's going to be done by um, the ultimate parent entity. And this is giving a framework of what's the tax jurisdiction, so the taxable location of the entity, um, what's the revenue for, you know, revenue to unrelated parties, revenue from um, related parties, what's your total revenue? So you can see what the tax authorities are trying to gauge an understanding of, are you a foreign, say, subsidiary in my country that is just the recipient of income coming in from your related party and therefore transfer pricing? Um, or is a lot of that going to be third party? What's your profit or loss before income tax? We have revenue. What's your profit and loss before income tax? What was the tax paid on that profit and loss? What was your, what was your income tax accrued for the current year? What's your capital? So your equity, what's your accumulated earnings, your number of employees, and then the tangible assets that you have. So they're trying to build a picture of your entity and the different countries that you're operating in to give them, okay, I guess, a high level assessment from a risk perspective and trying to understand. And just because, for example, you might have 100 employees in one location, the next step, and that'll go further when we go further in the other parts of the um, CBC reporting, is to really understand does the 100 people, what, what would we expect if we had 100 people? in one location and what what functionality do we have so when I go on to then the next part the next part is actually saying well can you list all of your entities what tax jurisdiction um, where are they actually um, paying their tax um, is it different from their incorporation as to where they're paying tax and then you're actually going through and identifying what are the different functions so when I go back to that prior slide and I see a hundred people in the Philippines, and I see they're providing an admin service, there's an expectation from a tax authority of what that income level might be, what the margins might be, and the profitability. If I have 100 engineers sitting here in Australia, um, technical engineers um, in the R&D area, there's going to be an expectation of potentially IP being developed here, an expectation of higher income. So this is where the tax authorities are going to start using this information to be able to actually understand the different risk levels. And this has all come out, as I talked about earlier, in this base erosion profit shifting. So that was under the OECD. And this is really about coming that the OECD countries and many other countries are, are actually going through this process, um, whether they're with the OECD, in a sense, one of the OECD countries or not, is really trying to get this transparency um, going around. It's also a really good tool. Uh, we've often used this as a tool for clients that are not yet at, even potentially at this level to understand their transfer pricing exposure in the various countries as well. So this is the CBC report. Then as part of the CBC reporting, we have another two, another two parts of those ones as well. So we have the master file. Now, another little confusing point for, for us when the master file first came out, and probably for many of you when you're talking with your clients, especially if they've been dealing with transfer pricing for a number of years. So the master file by definition under the CBC reporting, I'm gonna go through that. The master file that I, in a sense, grew up in transfer pricing with for the first 20 years of my transfer pricing career was the master file was like um, the core document that we used and adapted to the various countries and was the central piece of our transfer pricing. What they've actually taken that is the central piece in this instance with country by country reporting, but it's a lot more prescriptive than the way in which we may have um, may have conducted earlier in the earlier years when a lot of transfer pricing advisors focused on master file when we were talking about that. So there was some confusion when CBC reporting first came in as to what we really meant with the master file. So the master file is prepared by the ultimate parent entity. So often we're waiting as a foreign subsidiary here in Australia, we're waiting for the parent entity to prepare the master file because we need, and the parent entity may be lodging that master file, but that we're often waiting for that. It's like the blueprint of the overall group. It's going to go through 
the group's organization structure, a description of the group's business or businesses, if they've got various business units, what are the intangibles, what are the intercompany financial activities that are going on, so what debts and loans do we have in different places, and what's the overall financial and tax positions of the various entities. And it's a bit, when we talk about, in a sense, if you look back at your transfer pricing and, and those that have, um, I guess, heard me present and, and worked with us before, you're really trying to build the story. Obviously the factually correct story, but you're trying to assume that a tax authority has no idea on your company, what you're doing, how you're operating, and you're really trying to build the story for them in this situation. So the master file is, is quite prescriptive of what needs to be completed. And this is just about building the story of the overall group um, and how that, um, how that group operates, where your intangibles, what's the description of the business and all of those intercompany transactions. Now that's gonna then interlink with the local file. So I'm gonna hand you over to Kevin to start going through the local file. All right, thanks, Shannon. Um, so the local file, as, as, as we have gone through earlier, um, is a part of the country by country reporting. It's one component of it. So from the OECD guidelines perspective, a local file is similar to what you would call a local transfer pricing documentation in the past. Most country that has country by country reporting requirements has followed the OECD guidelines format for the local file. However, in Australia, we like to be different we did not follow the OECD version of the local file for our country by country report, uh, reporting obligations. Instead, we've got what we call the Australian version of the local file, or in short, we just call it the local file, uh, Australian local file. Now, before we go into details of what an Australian local file is and looks like, um, just remember one thing, as Shannon has highlighted earlier, this is not the same as your local transfer pricing documentation, especially for those that have their transfer pricing documentation done centrally offshore, but maybe by the head office. Um, they are following the OECD format. Just have this in mind and let the head office know that, you know, there are difference between the two files. Okay, so what is an Australian local file? This is actually a form that an SG or significant global entity need to lodge, fill and lodge with the ATO to fulfill their country by country reporting obligations. Okay, the Australian local file consists of three components. You have your part A, you have your part B, and you have the short form. Um, now, I think most of you may be somewhat familiar with the disclosure that's going into part A of the local file. It is basically a glorified IDS form. It is a little bit more detailed in terms of disclosure of your international related party dealings, your transfer pricing methodology, um, whether or not you have transfer pricing documentation, um, whether or not you have applied any simplification measure like your, you know, your simplified transfer pricing record keeping options to the transactions you have uh, during the year. That is part A. Then you have what you call the part B. This is more like an extension to your disclosure in part A. Basically, it asks you to disclose whether or not um, you have intercompany agreements or APA in place for the transaction you have disclosed in part A. Also being an SGE, you are required to prepare uh, a general purpose financial statement in Australia and provide that to the ATO. If you have not only already done that through ASIC, part B is where you can do that. Um, you can actually attach your GPFS to part B of the local file and launch it with the ATO, okay? Now, this looks like a lot of work. You know, you have to go through your Part A disclosure and then you have to check each transaction and whether or not you need to disclose anything on part, uh, in Part B. Um, but don't stress because you may not need to include every, uh, all transactions you have disclosed in Part A for Part B. There are some exemptions that allows you to exclude some um, transactions you have in Part A from Part B. It generally it looks at whether or not um, uh, this is a low risk transactions or whether or not you have applied any simplification measure to your transfer, uh, your international related part dealings. Again, that means that this is a low risk transaction. Obviously the exemption may vary from company uh, to company depending whether or not you meet certain criteria. Um, if you're unsure, feel free to reach out to us after the webinar and then we can work this out with you. 
Um, so finally, then you have your short form, the last component of the, your local farm. This form is in fact quite short. Uh, it only contains five questions, but depending on your company structure, the answer could be quite long. Um, on a high level, the short form requires you to provide information relating to your company's operation in Australia. Now this will include an overview of your organizational structure, um, an overview of your business description and strategy, whether or not you have business restructuring during the year or the prior year, whether or not you have any transfer of intangible, uh, intangible properties with your overseas related parties during the year or prior year, and what are your key competitors here in Australia. Again, this is just on a high level. Depending on the complexity of your company's operation, you may need to provide additional details in the short form. For example, if you think about you have a company with multiple business segments, then you may need to provide description for each business segment in the short form rather than on a holistic view of the whole company, right? Okay, so that is essentially what Australian Local File is. While it looked like a lot of work, there are some ways you could reduce the disclosure that needs to go into the local file. Now the ATO has, you know, is kind enough to provide us with some administration concession, which allows you to skip part A and part B of the local file and just submit short form um, for the local file. Um, you can do this if you miss certain criteria, included, including you have, um, say you have um, under 2 million Australian dollars worth of related party dealings, or you are eligible to apply the small taxpayer or materiality options under the simplified transfer pricing record keeping rules. And you do not have any dealings that are captured under what you call the short form exemption list. Now this is basically related party dealings involving derivatives, trademark, patent, design, copyright, IP, and anything of capital nature, which includes intercompany loans. So if, if you have any of those, you cannot uh, apply this exemption. Okay, so assuming you meet all these criteria, then you can just submit the short form and not worry about part AFP for your local file. Okay, um, Shen, can we go to the next slide, please? So, okay, so if you remember, there are three components to the local uh, country by country reporting. We've, we've talked about the Australian local file. We also have the country by country report, we have, and we have the master file. Now, to meet your country by country reporting obligation in Australia, you need to lodge all three components um, with the ATO. Now, before you ask me about the country by country reporting lodgement, as many of you have experienced this before, this is there is an exemption for this. You know, in, in particular, this particular report can be lodged in a foreign jurisdiction on your behalf. For example, you might have uh, the head office lodging it for you in their country, but it can only be done if that specific country has an information sharing arrangement or agreement with Australian government for country by country reporting purposes. So if they do, yes, your head office or your foreign uh, related parties can lodge the country by country reporting on your behalf but you also need to inform the ATO that the country by country report will be lodged by a member of your group outside of Australia. And this can be done as part of your local file lodgement. There's a section in your Australian local file that allows you to include this information and provide it to the ATO. Okay, for the local Australian local file and master file, unfortunately, you still need to do that. Uh, you still need to lodge it in Australia. I'm not sure why they can't do an information exchange, especially for the master file. But at the moment, we can't do overseas lodgement. So we need to have the master file and the local file lodged in Australia with, with ATO by the due date. Um, so that is what an Australian local file lodgement looks like in Australia. So with all this in mind, I guess the next question is, when do we need to lodge all these files, right? Um, maybe, Ishi, do you mind walking us through the timing for the lodgement and perhaps share with us some tips and tricks on how to we can do this in an efficient way? Right, no problem, Kevin. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks for going through the local file. Uh, funny thing is, uh, for those that have prepared the IDS, uh, when I, the local file is first introduced, when I looked at it, I'm like, oh, the local file is actually... Um, 
the ideas, but on steroids, right? It's basically the same thing, but you, you just put in a lot more information on it. So I guess those that prepared ideas will know what I mean. Next thing would be timing, right? One of the first questions that clients ask, even before knowing what CBC reporting is, when is the deadline? Um, now, generally, CBC reporting statements need to be launched within 12 months after the end of your income year, which means if your company is a June balancer, right, for 30th June to 2020 income year, you will need to launch it by um, 30th, 20, 30th of June 2021, right? But there are circumstances where the ATO provides deferrals and the main one that we've experienced so far would be for December balances where the deadline was deferred to 29th of January due to you know, year-end holidays, your know, Christmas and your uh, New Year's, as well as for this year, unfortunately, would be the COVID-19. So bad news. Um, apart from the general 12 months deadline, you can actually choose to launch part A of the local file at the same time as your tax return which effectively replace the question two to question 17. So bear in mind, just this, these questions alone of your IDS in the tax return, you still need to uh, fill in the other questions of the IDS. So based on our experience, most of our clients were not able to actually obtain the detailed information for the lodgement of the local file in time. So they may, might have to launch uh, on a later date bear in mind that this only applies to part A of the local file where you can still launch your master file and part B if you meet the criteria before the 12 months deadline. Right, so that's timing. The next frequently asked question is definitely the extensions, right? We have a close relation with the CPC reporting department due to a number of applications of extensions and exemptions. I'll talk about exemptions later, but with extensions, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. It really depends on your company's circumstances, right? Um, now, COVID-19 is a good excuse or difficulty in obtaining information from your head office is another one. So what we do is to understand your company's circumstances and then lay out to the ATO during the application process to request for an extension. Then, of course, next we're going to talk about the exemptions, right? Anything to avoid CBC reporting at all, if possible. Um, there are three main expenses that are available. First would be the administrative relief, where you're not required to actually request um, for an exemption from the ATO, right? Which is a good thing. Then we have the fast track exemptions, which have a series of specified conditions that you need to self assess. And then lastly, exemptions on other basis. So next slide would be the administrative relief on the local file, right? We've gone through the uh, first will be the local file where, I mean, it will be the CPC report, sorry, where if your parent entity has an obligation to lodge or your surrogate parent entity, which is an entity that is chosen by the group to voluntarily launch the CBC report in a jurisdiction that has an active CBC exchange agreement with Australia in place, then um, you can only need notify when you launch your local file or master file. I mean, this explained by Kevin, Kevin earlier. So what happens if your parent entity is actually not in a jurisdiction that exchange data with Australia, right? First, this will need to be communicated with your parent entity to see what's, what's the stance of the management with regard to CBC reporting. Right now that CBC reporting is rampant, the, your parent entity would most likely know the consequences of this um, the re, re, CBC reporting. Right? Your group may have companies in other jurisdictions which also has CBC reporting obligations. Right. So the group will need to then make a decision to select a surrogate parent entity to launch these CBC reporting statements in a jurisdiction that has the CBC exchange agreement in place, right? Just to avoid any um, implications from the other jurisdictions, even though other than Australia, you might have uh, implications in another jurisdiction, right? Next, we have um, relief for local file. So for local file, the main thing would be that your company will need to be an Australian resident, not 
APA and have no international related party dealings. You'll be able to know this if you take no in question 26 of your tax return. And then we have tax exam entities under division 50, you know, subsidiaries who have taxable income. But if your holding company is actually uh, is under, is a tax exam entity, then you still be able to apply, I mean, have this administrative belief. One exception to this is that if um, you are the CPC reporting parent and you have foreign entity or PE, you will still need to lodge a CPC report, but not a master file or a local file. Then we have entities in the national tax equivalent regime, NTER list, which is um, pretty few entities would be in. Similar to the above, if you are the CPC reporting parent entity and you have foreign entity or PE, you need to lodge a CPC report, but not a master file or local file. And then lastly, on the next slide, we have dominant entities. Yes, um, for dominant entities, it will only apply if you are the only Australian presence entity or PE of your global group, and you're not the ultimate parent entity, and you have notified the ATO that no tax return is required, right? But if you are not the only Australian presence, then the obligation of the other entity will still remain, and it may apply to you. So having said that, if you are not required to lodge, uh, you're not required to lodge the local file if you have already notified the ATO and that no tax return is required. So that's still fine for the local file part. Now that we have gone through the admin relief, on the next slide, we'll go through the fast track exemptions. Okay. Um, yeah, as you can see, these are the specified conditions that you need to meet before you can request for the fast track exemptions. So first one would be if you are an Australian SGE with no um, foreign operations, including PE, then you can request exemption for the CPC report and the master file. And in addition, if then you have no um, international related by dealings, then you can also apply for the local file exemption. Um, the third one would be if your annual income, global income exceeded Australian $1 billion, but then it falls below um, foreign currency threshold due to the currency movement, um, then you can apply to exempt the CPC report. On top of that, if Australia is the only jurisdiction then has an obligation to lodge a master file, then you can apply to exempt the, the master file as well. As you can see that the ATO is actually pretty reasonable in not forcing local entities that are not parent entities to lodge the CPC report and master file, which are generally the responsibility of the parent entity, right? Then we have, um, if you're an SGE, but then because of the business restructuring and you're not no longer an SGE, then you can apply for a CPC report and muscle fire exemption. Next would be foreign resident with an Australian PE. Um, then you can apply for the CPC report exemption. Lastly, you are if you are a foreign resident but with an Australian PE, right? You have no international real party dealings and no cross border internal internal dealings. So it means which means it's not just real party dealings, but you also have to show that you have no cross border internal dealings, which is pretty rare um, for PE to not have internal dealings. So and for this, you can apply for the local file exemptions. You know, these are the current fast track exemptions available from the ATO. Um, then finally, on the next slides, we have other exemptions like, um, you know, we have experience where um, clients are winding up their operations, but then um, the cessation or winding up the, of an Australian presence will not be considered as a reasonable grounds for exemptions. So it depends on the activities or the international related party dealings that the entity have had prior to the winding up, right? If it can be proved that the entity's business activities or transfer pricing risks are immaterial, then we can consider applying for an exemption, right? Lastly, um, we have experienced a lot of clients that have difficulties in obtaining information from their parent entity, mainly due to, you know, the because the Australian operations are actually very small as compared to the overall group, or Sometimes you have like a huge foreign equity investment holdings. It, is, it has a lot of business operations across the globe. And unfortunately, they have a local Australian presence. Then what we do is we generally have a chat with the ATO um, and then come, up, then come up with a 
best approach to see whether we apply for an extension or we could apply for a temporary exemption. So it depends on a case by case basis, right? Now that we've gone through the exemptions, let's look at how to lodge on the, on the next slides, right? Unfortunately, the OECD had to make things difficult for us where you're required to actually convert the CBC reporting statements into an XML format that meets the XML schema by the OECD before you actually launch, right? So it, it makes sense as we are trying to unify a universal format to be exchanged between jurisdictions, right? So before you launch, you have to change it. You have to convert to XML, then only you can launch to be accepted, right? So now, now that we have accepted, exhausted all the avenues of extensions, exemptions, options. Shannon, it'd be great if you can tell us what's the consequence of failure to launch these CPC reporting statements. So um, so we look at, um, I guess, the penalties. And I'll go, go back, sorry, the, go back to the penalties. So this notice, um, this is the type of notice that we um, have had many people, whether it be the finance manager, tax directors, or accountants ringing up and going, I've received this notice. Um, what do I do? And and in, and actually, even just what two three weeks ago, we had a few calls um, with people saying, um, "What is country by country reporting?" My clients received this notice, and apparently, it's transfer pricing. Now, why are the penalties so severe? And many people look at it and um, and ask why the penalty is so severe. It's actually because they've been, they had um, they put significant penalties there for 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 what we call these SGE significant global entity, and it really was to get your attention. It was to have a situation where the penalties were so high that there, the alternative for the company was only to comply and, and provide this information as part of actually trying to implement this global BEPS, BEPS program. So what we have seen in year one, um, these letters were sent out and it said, oh, you look, next time it'll cost you 525. Some letters that we've seen actually say, you're late and you better lodge it within you know 14 days etc or you will be fined 525 so just variations of this let these um this letter um what we haven't seen yet is anyone that's actually been charged the penalty just yet but i think year one and two things were sailing and there was a lot of leniency i don't think that that's going to be the case going forward um, so if you do get one of these types of letters, um, give us a call. We can actually um, reach out to the tax office and actually start discussions uh, on that and, and assist you with that side of it. But it really needs to be considered as a priority for companies. And even if you are a small entity here in Australia, if you are part of this group where you have an SGE, you are going to have to comply with these, um, with these requirements. So... How can we um, help with a lot of this? So what we've gone through um, today, uh, going through well, what is country by country reporting? So being aware of when you might have a situation. Now, sometimes that be, can be really quite easy to see and easy to spot. If you do have a challenging situation, feel free to reach out. We've had many a times we've actually even had to escalate it up to the ATO to get confirmation that we all agree whether they are, whether there is a significant global entity and what the CBC reporting status is. Um, we can assist you with preparing your CBC reporting statements. We can, um, and when that can be, include the CBC reporting, the master file, if you're Australian um, multinational here, uh, most master files probably prepared overseas, and then also your local file. We can lodge that through our software. So we do have the software that enables us to input all of the data, convert it, and then lodge it through. We can help you apply for extensions as well, and also for exemptions. Um, so if you do have any questions on it, always making sure as, as Kevin's gone through, you know, with the local file, the country by country reporting local file doesn't mean you've actually done your documentation. So we can even help you sometimes with that, um, articulating that back to your head office where you might not be getting the support from head office and, and them understanding the requirements here as well. So we can work with you on those um, different areas as well. Now we do have some more webinars um, coming up soon. There's been a lot of developments in transfer pricing and not only transfer pricing, some of the international tax aspects of, uh, that impact on transfer pricing as well. So we go, are going to do a similar situation to today um, on multinational anti-avoidance law, so the MUL, and when you need to be focused or be aware of it and what does it mean going for, um, through from that. So if you do have any 
entities that are foreign subsidiaries or you're dealing on um, an international basis. Um, we'll also um, go through the international dealing schedule. So hopefully we get the nice update for the new schedule. They always like to update it every other year. We are going to have a few other webinars. We've um, had some requests to do one on the hybrid mismatch. So there's a um, practice guidance, um, a PCG that's got, uh, uh, come out from the ATO on the hybrid mismatch. So what that means is, especially if you've got subsidiaries here in Australia that have American parents, there are some rules overseas. And a lot of the time with the US, we have it, um, we call it their subpart F rules, which means um, something might be a deduction here, but it's actually not declared as income over there when you've got an intercompany transaction. These rules actually come in and say, well, hang on, there's a mismatch here. And the PCG, which is actually out in draft at the moment and will be finalized soon, basically says, if you can't prove that, um, that we, the, the rules don't apply, then you can't claim a deduction for that, for that item. So that's really um, quite harsh, the rules as they're standing in draft at the moment um, as well. And then we have, um, we are gonna to touch on the debt pricing PCG that's come, um, that's been out for a little while. And there was a new intangibles, um, transfer pricing and intangible PCG that was only just released just over a week or so ago in draft. So we will have that webinar coming up soon. So feel free to register for any of those. If there's any other topics you want to hear us talk about, um, let us know as well. But I'll open it up now to um, questions and see um, what questions um, that we've got. Okay, we've got a question here. What software can we use to lodge the documents? HC, do you want to maybe um, answer that one? Right. Um, I guess um, for the software part, right, um, I would I would imagine, I think all the databases that um, in relation to transfer pricing would have that, I would imagine have that BAP software in place mm. that you could convert. I mean, the most important element would be to convert the file to XML, right? Before you you, you actually um, um, make a decision on that software, make sure to ask this question first. So, yep. yeah, I mean, the type of software, I think there are a few software um, in the market they actually can um, convert to the XML format. So yeah, and some of the software, and I guess that um, a lot of the big accounting firms created their own um, platform. Some of them use the same platform that we use as well. Um, some of the software providers don't um, allow you to buy it on a piecemeal, like one entity mm. um, basis. Some of them do, um, so you could reach out, but then the piecemeal is quite um, significant. So that's why we end up um, seeing that we do a lot, of, um, a lot for accounting firms and their clients, and then also for companies direct. Uh, because we have such a large volume, we're actually able to um, offer that uh, lodgement cheaper than what, what they can get themselves. So mm, it's yep. probably reaching out and seeing if they'll, A, if you've only got one or two, whether whether you can actually get it on a piecemeal basis. It's a bit like your tax software though. Just because you can get the software program doesn't mean you know how to drive it, if you know what I mean, like an FBT or something like that. So that's, the, that's where I think that they've made it um, a bit of a challenge for most advisors um, in being able to do it. Um, does a country by country report, master file, local file need to be filed if the ultimate foreign parent entity is a not for profit charity? That's uh, there's an exclusion for charities, is there? Yeah, so that's the interesting one. So just now I've gone through the um, you know, the tax exempt under Division 50. Mm. Under Division 50, um, there are entities that um, satisfied that ruling would be. Um, well, that would be charity, right? So now we're talking about ultimate foreign parent entity. Mm. Right? In that sense, what we can do is still um, request for an exemption through ATO, tell them that we have ultimate foreign entity, uh, parent entities are actually an FP charity. Because, I mean, I would imagine the same principle would apply because they are they're deeming the um, tax exempt entities to be exempt. So I would imagine this will uh, apply the same way as well. Yeah. Now, there's um, two people that have put their hand up. Do you mind just putting a question through into the questions? I'll just go, we've got just um, two other questions and then we can answer your questions. So I'll just see there's a little hand up. Which, um, uh, and the other one I have, there's what if, what if I don't receive the master file from my parent company? What if they, what if, so what if they don't get the, the master file? They ask for it and they want to lodge their CBC. What if they don't get the... Um, we have, we have got, um, circumstances like this. Um, quite a few times. Um, what we do is you have to tell your parent entity that the consequences, as Shana has mentioned, is up to 525000 
right? The ATO makes no exception as to whether they, they understand that the difficulty to obtain information is, um, is there, but then you have to show to the ATO that what's the reason behind um, the, and the apparently not actually giving that uh, master file? Is it because of confidentiality issue, which means um, the, the ATO, the sole purpose of that is for ATO to, to self-assess the risks. And, and then we would go from there. But generally speaking, um, the ATO would want your master file in place. So you have you'll be have you have like a back and forth between your parent entity and ATO. Then um, at the end of the day, you come up with a consensus to see whether it's a temporary exemption or exemption extensions um, or not. Yeah. Yeah. Next one we've got. Um, uh, how do we judge whether a transaction is part of the relevant agreement series instead of raising this query to clients? Are there any attributes we can look to make our own judgment? Um, I, I think on this, this is a very interesting one, the relevant series agree agreements. Um, what the definition says, basically, if you have an agreement, and uh, a master agreement, um, for, for, for one transaction or, or multiple transactions. Um, but because of, um, you know, usually it, it happens on commodities type of arrangement where you have same product with same party, similar pricing, but because the contract goes through every single, uh, every transaction that you make, every, every shipment it comes, you've got one uh, agreement that is considered uh, a relevant service arrangement uh, agreement. So I think the key thing to look at is you have the same related uh, counterparties, the terms and condition remain largely the same, except for the pricing, then um, you would then be included as a relevant ser uh, agreement series. Mm. Yeah, and then there's one that just comes on from that while you're on a roll there, Kevin. Um, mm. Local file part, part B, um, what are the similar, what are the differences between these two questions? They look very similar, the 53 and the 239. Do you know those off the top of your head or are you quickly looking um, it up? I, I, I don't know the code at the back of my head, but let's make no, it. No. <laughs> I should have, right? But um, let, let's, let's see what it is about. Mm. Country by country. So I'll go jump down to the one of the other questions that we with it while you're looking that up. So do master files require localization to ensure it complies to local Australian requirements, or is it fine to lodge master files as they are? Yeah, um, it's fine to lodge as they are. It's recommended to lodge as they are, yeah. unless um, there, are, there are also circumstances where the the because of confidentiality issue from the head entity, they may want to just share information on the local, based on the local Australian business operations. Then that's still fine. So as long as the master file would show you know the the respective criteria you know the, the actual blueprint of the the group itself, and answer those five questions. But in relation to local local Australian business operations, that's still fine. So both ways are fine. Yeah. And then we have another one while you're looking at all those details there, Kevin, as well. Um, the 215 uh, two and 216. And um, what is the deferred foreign currency payment arrangement? What are the differences between the foreign currency reporting types? <laughs> right. Okay. Well, the deferred um, foreign currency payment, I think that would be based on your accounting standards, whether your foreign currency payment based on your uh, accounting treatment, whether those um, foreign currency has been deferred or not. I think then we have your realized and unrealized um, portion as well. Mm -hmm. So that's where it comes in. Um, generally speaking, when we report the um, foreign currency in the local file, we'll, look, we'll have to look at the realized um, foreign currency reporting. And this goes in line with um, the, your tax return. So you have to think of all this um, information um, should link back to your first, your income tax return. Secondly, to your IDS, to make sure that those figures are consistent. So if you are talking about foreign currency, um, whether it has been deducted or gained, then you have to relook at your what, what you have um, treated these foreign currency in your tax return as. If it's, um, if only realized gains are um, treated as deducted, I mean, um, gained, then you, then you have to 
um, reflect this into your local file, you know, vice versa on the deduction as well. So the main thing is consistency, making mm. sure that it uh, it reflects what you have um, uh, reported in your income tax return. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, on the 239, I can't, sorry, I can't find the question. Do you mind? Um, the question is so um on 53 and 239 what are the differences between these two questions they look very similar so between question 53 and, and 239 yeah i just can't find 239 here okay so i need to yeah if that person wants to put us um put a it came up as an anonymous but if you want to just put um the question or put your name there and then we can shoot you an email um back later when you've got it because as you can see, there's a lot of questions on there, yes, <laughs> on the country by country. So, um, I, yeah, we, when we do this, we used to look at the question and not too much on the code. So correct, yeah, I, yeah, we're not yeah. really. That's why when I saw the codes, I was like, I hope you guys know all the codes because we're not really going to be looking yeah. at it all depends because um, there has been revisions between the coding, right? So um, in 2018, they changed the coding in local file where some of the coding will apply 2018 and before and some of the coding will apply um, after 2018. Right, yeah. 53 is the has this written agreement been previously provided mm -hmm. to the ATO, right? So, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure about the 239 either. I'm not, sure. um, I wanted, yeah. I mean, I'm not able to so, uh, yeah, whoever put that, um, if you did that question, if you want to shoot us a quick email, we can mm -hmm. actually then have a look and also just make sure then it's on the same year that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So, I think that's got all the questions that have come through. Um, and uh, we've got a lot of different webinars that we've got, especially um, within Asia, there's new transfer pricing rules in Malaysia. So there's a lot going on there. So we've done a, num a number of webinars over there. We're actively involved with um, a lot of what's going on in the new legislation coming out. Um, also with the changes that we've seen in Singapore as well, and also our Australian webinar. So you can like and subscribe, nothing better on a Friday night, or if we get locked down here in Melbourne, you've got some videos to, um, to watch as well. But uh, feel free to reach out if there's anything else um, that we can assist you with. Um, thanks very much for joining us. And we'll speak to you in, um, the, in about a month's time and we'll go through the, another exciting topic, um, the mail. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.